two considerations. <clears throat> here in Atlanta, I guess, for the first time here in Fayetteville, in Atlanta. And uh, on the streets of St. Abdon, the two considerations actually on our the motu proprio response uh, made for the motu proprio Pope Francis, July the 16th, 2021, which is a few weeks ago, 15 days ago, only a little time ago. And uh, Bishop Sanborn made a response to the motu proprio and his argument, Bishop Sanborn said he began as bishop in Florida, uh, argues when he was ordained by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, uh, was once the director of the seminary of the Society of Pius X in America until 1983, and then now is uh, been in several places, one of the nine priests of, uh, that uh, was expelled from the Society in 83, uh, due in part to the problem of the city of Vicantism. And uh, so here he argues that this motu proprio of Pope Francis, he's had another example that proves that the recognized and resist position, this is called by Father Chicada before he died, and the position of the Society of Pius X, which is that we cannot work with, we cannot uh, uh, compromise and work with the, 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 the modernist church, and yet we recognize the modernist church. He says there are three groups of traditionalists in his analysis or his reaction to the motu proprio of Pope Francis. The first group are those who are within the indole communities, and these groups are those who uh, celebrate the Latin Mass, who try to practice tradition, and say that they accept Vatican II, and say they accept the new Mass, but in reality, they hate Vatican II, and they hate the new Mass. And this group says we have to coexist. We have to coexist with the authorities because they are the authorities and we must obey them. This group secretly hates Vatican II and secretly loves tradition, but finds it must coexist because of the structure of the church, therefore obeys the commands of Rome. And they have their Latin Mass only because of, by the motu proprio, of the various motu proprios of John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and now Pope Francis, who wants to eliminate the Latin Mass and has manifested his hatred of it his entire papacy and before. Then also the second group, which is the Society of St. Pius X, the Archbishop of Lefebvre group, which one of his priests calls Lefebvreism, the teaching of Lefebvreism. And that is a group that says we cannot coexist with these modernists, and that uh, the, so we cannot coexist with them because we we cannot uh, obey them and their illegitimate commands, but we must recognize the Pope as the Pope. We must recognize the bishops as bishops, but we cannot obey their wicked commands. And this is an absurd position, says Bishop Sanborn, because it's just like if Frank and Judy are walking down the street, or Jude, Frank and Mary are walking down the street, and Frank says, I am with Mary. And Mary says, I hate your guts. I reject you. You are not with me. So if Frank says he's with Mary, but Mary says she's not with Frank, then they're all together because it requires two to be together. And the relationship between the Society of St. Pius X and Rome, the more important member of the relationship is the Pope. And so in that relationship, if the Pope says, you're not with me, and yet you say you are with him, this is absurd and false. Therefore, the second position, says Bishop Sanborn, is an illogical one that can't be tolerated. But the third position of the state of Vicantism, this is a position which must be accepted, says Bishop Sanford, because in this record, guys, we cannot coexist. And the motu proprio Pope Francis, and what's happening to the SSPX, is proof that we cannot coexist. And by now, people should recognize that the motu proprio Pope Francis, that coexistence is not an option. Because now, but we tried to coexist with Pope Francis, and what happened? He decided to give us a motu proprio that says, I'm shutting down your mass. And you have to re-ask permission to get to have mass. And if you don't ask the permission, you can't have mass. I'm shutting down your mass. And besides, you only have your mass because of my permission. And now I'm taking my permission away. And what was the purpose of Pope Francis from the very beginning? It was to destroy the Latin mass in Catholic tradition because the Latin mass is diametrically and completely opposed to the new Mass, and it is. 
And the, and the true faith is diametrically and completely opposed to the new faith of modernism, and it is. Therefore, they cannot coexist together. And we must recognize, says Bishop Sanborn, that since the church can never lead souls away from God as a whole and can never teach heresy and has never done this down the last 2,000 years, since this is the case, therefore, we must take on the position of significantism, which is they have somehow lost their authority. They have lost their authority, and they are not the bishops of the church. He's not the pope of the church. They are not the members of the church, especially as regards their jurisdiction and authority. That they're not the church, and therefore we reject them. Because if we accept them, then we must obey. And we do not obey because what they command is against God, and the, the rule of the, the property of the church called indefectibility was given to our holy church by Christ at the very beginning. And since we know the church cannot deface, which means the church cannot fail, and we see that yet the Pope and the bishops and the Vatican II church is telling souls, you must follow modernism, you must follow liberalism, you must follow the new mass. Therefore, the only logical thing we can do as Catholics is to reject that church completely, not make deals with the Pope, and certainly not mention his name in the canon. And then, and so says Bishop Sanborn in his argument. And then he gives an example to prove the latter point. He says, how is it that they took over the church? And the people of the church is when they, for the first infiltrators of the church, they were like hijackers on an airplane. An example that he apparently gives frequently. They're hijackers on an airplane, they get up with guns, they get up dressed like thugs, they look like thugs, they take over the plane, and then they take the plane and they're going to fly it into a mountain. These are hijackers. But what happened? With Vatican II, there was a new kind of hijacking. And so what they said is, these new hijackers, we're going to go to pilot school, we're going to go to stewardess school, and we're going to learn how to fly planes, and we're going to join the airline, and we're going to become pilots, and we're going to join the airline, and we're going to become stewardesses, and we're going to be flight attendants, and we're going to go out and deliver people time and time again to their correct destination. But then one day, we will take over the plane, and we're going to fly it into a mountain. And our Lord said, let them be anathema. And you can clearly see, says, Pope, uh, says, uh, says Bishop Sandmar in this example, that the only answer is Sedevicantism. That we have to recognize that they are hijacking our church, they're not members of our church, and they cannot be accepted as members of our church. So here a brief response to the claims of Bishop Sandmar and the common claims of Sedevicantus uh, throughout the world. They say we cannot coexist. Now there are two kinds of coexistence. He says you must have separate. Here's an example of the sacred scripture that we must separate from those that are wicked. And yet you cannot coexist with the wicked. If you read the Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 13, where our Lord speaks of the kingdom of heaven, which is not the kingdom of heaven in heaven, but the kingdom of heaven on earth. And in one of his parables, the kingdom of heaven on earth, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a sower that went out to sow seed. And he sowed good seed in the field. But what happens? There grew up cockle amongst the weeds. And then what happened? The servants came and said, how did the cockle get amongst the wheat? You didn't plant cockle. We didn't plant cockle. And yet there is cockle. There are weeds amongst the wheat. How did this happen? And what did the Lord Jesus Christ say? Satanas has done this. Satan has done this. The translation for Satan is the enemy. The enemy has done this. Satan has done this. Well, then let's solve the problem. Let us separate the wheat and the chaff. And what did Jesus Christ say? Contrary to the teaching of Bishop Sandor, he said, let the wheat and the chaff grow together. Lest, when pulling out all the, ch the chaff, you gather wheat also, and cause more damage than good. But don't worry. The time will come 
when every single chaff, every single weed, every single cockle shall be gathered together and burnt, but the wheat shall be gathered into my barn. This is going to happen at the time of the heart. Hence, we have a dogma of our holy church, that the kingdom of heaven on earth, from its beginning, not just with Christ and Adam and the 12 apostles 2,000 years ago, from its true beginning with Adam and Eve, from the very beginning of time until the very end of time, there will be cockle inside the church. There will be Judas priests inside the church. There will be chaff amongst the wheat, and they will have to coexist. One reason why God allows them to coexist is in order that the wheat might be tested to prove itself. Because remember the parable, in the parable we know that wheat can never turn into chaff, and chaff can never turn into wheat. However, we know in the Catholic Church that we are living souls, and we can be chaff on Monday, and wheat on Tuesday, and chaff on Wednesday, and wheat on Thursday, and we can become wheat and chaff and go back and forth. Therefore, Christ says, wait to the harvest. Some things will appear to be wheat, but it's actually chaff. Other things may appear to be chaff, but they're actually wheat. Wait to the harvest. So there can be, and according to Christ, there must be a certain coexistence. And yet, there must be a separation. For the wheat should not become chaff. And so there is some kind of limited separation that can be there. And here we show the church, the subjective and the objective, that who is a member of the church? Whoever is baptized, as St. Mark Relevant tells us, and whoever professes the faith publicly before men and says, I am a Catholic, a member of the church, and who has not yet been thrown out. Let's go back to the example, which is a very excellent example given by Bishop Sandmore. Only the parable works the other way. According to the parable or example of Bishop Sandmore, he says, now what happens? The hijackers, instead of being hijackers on an airplane, who are foreigners who enter the plane, who do not belong to United Airlines, who are not men, who are not stewardesses, they take over the plane. They are clearly intruders in the plane. But what about the second case? Is the pilot who has been flying for United for the last 20 years, is he a pilot of United or not? Did he go through United Pilot School? Yes, he did. Did he graduate? Yes, he did. Did he fly planes? Yes, he did. Is he flying a plane today? Yes, it is. Is he wearing a United uniform? Yeah, he is. Did he check the sign on the, on the side of the plane? It says U-N-I-T-E-D, United, it must be good. He is flying a United plane at 30,000 feet. He's sitting in the United cockpit, and he is a pilot who has now been given instruction by his communist handlers Time to fly the plane into a mountainside and destroy everyone on the plane. He also happens to have with him a co-pilot who is his graduate buddy. He also happens to have in the back a whole bunch of stewardesses and flight attendants. Now the people on the plane find out about it. And the city of the in row 17B stands up and says, he's not a pilot. He's not a flight attendant. Those aren't really United uniforms. They didn't graduate from United school. They're not true pilots, because true pilots fly planes in order to save people. True pilots fly planes and fly from one destination to another. And these pilots are flying the plane to a cliff. Therefore, I declare to everyone, they are not pilots, and they are not co-pilots, and they are not clever stewardesses. Therefore, take them out. This is foolishness. The fact is, that he really is the pilot who flies from United Airlines. He did really fly and graduate from United School in order to be a pilot, and he is now deciding to fly the pilot into a cliff because he is an infiltrator. But he belongs to United. So likewise, in the Holy Roman Catholic Church, there are bishops and cardinals, such as Cardinal Rampola, a hundred years ago, in 1903, as a Mason, and most likely a Satanist, was elected the head of our holy church, but it was vetoed. Who elected him? Saints or fellow pilots who were infiltrators of the church? He was in fact elected by fellow pilots who were infiltrators of the church, true cardinals and true bishops of the church. These true cardinals were undone by the veto of Franz Joseph, and therefore they said, all right, 
We'll pick this old Italian cardinal, who doesn't speak any other language besides Italian, who is a simple parish priest, who is really dumb, and who we can easily manipulate, and he'll die soon. We'll elect him, the Pope, his name was Giuseppe Sarto, and then we'll control him, and then we'll get our guy in afterwards. Turned out Giuseppe Sarto, the simple parish priest, Giuseppe Sarto, who only spoke Italian, didn't speak French, didn't speak German, didn't speak any other language, turned out Giuseppe Sarto became St. Pius X. Turned out he was the greatest enemy that could ever have been to them, and they only knew it, they would never have elected them. God is in charge of the church, not men. The example given by Bishop Sanborn is, in fact, a very good example to prove sedimentism completely wrong, and not to prove it right. And furthermore, what about the passengers? Supposing you're a passenger on the airplane, and you're a private pilot who flies 737s as recreationally, and you're a, and you're a private, you retired as stewardess, and you're not really an active stewardess anymore, but you used to work for United as a stewardess, and you used to be a co-pilot, and you're sitting on the plane. Well, I, I'm, I'm not approved. I'm no longer approved. I used to be a card-carrying member of United, but I got fired because of my evil boss last week. I'm not a member of United, and I'm not a United pilot anymore. I don't fly United. I fly Delta. I like to see this plane crash. I don't like United. This will be better for our sales. Besides, every minute Iraq, Aaron I is vaccinated. And so the fact is, so you got the Delta pilot sitting there, you got the United pilot sitting there, and they're all waiting. Yeah, you know, if I was in charge of United, this just wouldn't happen. Because Delta, we got policies that say that if you try to fly a plane to the cliff, you no longer belong to United, the Delta. That's a very good policy because that means Delta doesn't have to pay for the damages. Now the fact is that here it is, your plane is flying to a cliff. And there's a pilot of United. I'm not a United pilot. I don't work for United. I'm sorry. I can't do anything. I can't disobey the, the flight attendant who tells me put your hands on top of your head and and you know and do what I say as we crash this plane. If there's a rule that says you can't go to the cockpit because it's not safe. Of the very fact that there's a pilot up there who's trying to kill us, that probably isn't safe. But at the same time, the rule says I, I can't. And I believe this is a real plane. I believe this is really United Airlines, and they have policies. The policy says I can't go up to the cockpit. I can't do it. That would be immoral. What would happen if they survived that trip? You take that man and you stick him inside the 777 engine. That engine can chop up anything you put into it. The blade is designed so that if you put a cow into it, it chops it into bits and it goes out the back side. If you put a chicken in it, it chops it a bits and goes out the back side. Feed them to the 777. That's the proper procedure. What does the analogy of Bishop Sanborn and Clinton actually prove? If you're a pilot on the airplane and you're retired, and you're a pilot on the airplane and you were fired by United, and you weren't get, you didn't get your pension, I said, I didn't get my pension, I was fired by United, they deserve what's coming to them. Wait a minute, you're on the plane. Planes going inside the cliff. Why well, grab a parachute? Because I know the exit. Can you grab a parachute and fly off the plane? Or what do you do? Your duty is to invade the cockpit and take over the steering of the plane because the pilot has the right and he has the privileges given him by United Airlines to fly a United airplane from one United base to another United base. If he flies to a wrong one, like to go see Idi Amin in Uganda. He, that's a, that's, he's not, he doesn't have the right to do that. If he flies into a cliff, that's on the list of unapproved landing locations. And therefore, it is the duty of the pilot to say, I'm sorry, I would like you to fly this plane wherever you wish to fly it, but I have to do everything in my power to prevent you from flying into a mountainside. I am going to take over this airplane, and I'm going to stop this plane from flying, and if I can't stop them flying, I just happen to have a bunch of parachutes, and I'm going to hand out parachutes, and I'm going to take out a few flight attendants, which I wanted to do for many years anyway, in, in order to help take care of this problem. So the fact is, we have a situation where they are truly pilots of United. They are truly uh, 
stewardesses and flight attendants of United, and they are breaking the rules of United when they try to fly the plane into a cliff, and they are breaking the rules of airplanes when you try to fly into a cliff, and therefore a pilot on the plane, or a regular citizen on the plane, who even belongs to the competition airline, has the right duty, responsibility, to try to prevent this tragedy from happening. Therefore, the correct thing to do is recognize that he is a pilot and resist his bad piloting. Therefore, the position of recognize and resist is the correct position in the situation in our church. Furthermore, we have, we have already the rules of the church, which are that if one is a superior and he commands you to do evil, the law of obedience and the virtue of obedience requires you to disobey the man in order to obey God. As it says in Acts chapter 5, we obey God rather than men. So therefore there is the obligation to disobey the pilot in order to obey the airline. There is the obligation to disobey the Holy Father, the vicar of Christ on earth, who is the successor of St. Peter, in order to obey Christ, and in order also to obey him as a true successor of Peter, who has the right to guide the ship of the church to its port of heaven. He does not have the right to gather it to another port. Now what about the argument of the contest of the indefectibility? The gods would not allow a pope or bishops of the church to guide the vast majority of churchmen faithful towards hell. But this would dis destroy the indefectibility of the church. But this would defeat or destroy the indefectibility of the church. St. Robert Bellman points out this is false. Go back to the Old Testament. There are multiple times when the vast majority of Jews went away from God and worshipped false gods. So much so that God said in the Old Testament, there are no prophets in Israel. And the Protestants quoted this statement of the Old Testament, see, the church is invisible, they claim. Because there were times in which there was no prophet in Israel. But St. Robert Bellman responds, when God said that to whichever prophet it was, there was no prophet in Israel, but, it, but at that time it was divided between Israel and Judah, and there were true prophets in Judah. Furthermore, not every prophet in Israel was wicked, for one of the prophets was the prophet Elias, the prophet Eliseus. And these prophets were surrounded by wicked prophets, so that the majority of prophets were wicked, but not every prophet. Therefore, there were always visible prophets in the church, even though they had to live in exile during the course of the history of our church. Come forward to the New Testament. In the time of the Arian crisis, the bishops of the church, including the bishop of Rome, Pope Liberius, said that they promoted the Arian heresy and had excommunicated St. Athanasius three times because he was anti-Arian and too vocal in his anti-Arianism. And the majority of bishops of the church taught the Arian heresy and ran Arian dioceses. The church did not die. St. Athanasius, St. Hilary, and others kept this church going through this crisis, just as in our present time, the Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre and those true priests of tradition keep the church alive in our times. Furthermore, there is a false understanding of obedience and coexistence. I do not disobey the Pope because he's not the Pope. Number one, if he's not the Pope, I can neither obey nor disobey him because he's not my superior. I can agree with him or disagree with him, but I cannot obey or disobey. Therefore, I do not disobey my superior, Bishop of Rome, in order because he's not the Bishop of Rome. I disobey him specifically because he is the Bishop of Rome. And the Bishop of Rome, named Pope Francis, he wants me to celebrate the new Mass. And when he tells me to celebrate it, I say no. That's disobedience to him, humanly speaking. Secondly, he wants me to teach the errors and heresies of Vatican II. And I say no. And therefore, I appear to be disobedient to him also in that way. 
and all the other immoral things that he wants me to do, I say no. I say them to my superior, just as my ancestor, the Bishop St. Paul, said to his superior, the Bishop of Rome, named St. Peter, I resist you to the face. Because you are asking me to, uh, to work with the Judaizers and to do circumcision, which will lead to heresy. Even though it is not directly a heresy, it will lead souls to heresy, and therefore I disobey. I have the right as a Catholic to disobey my superior when he leads others to sin, or when he directly teaches sin or heresy, as my ancestor St. Paul did. St. Peter listened to St. Paul and backed down. But if he had not listened, St. Paul would not have stopped. And therefore he said, by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, I resisted St. Peter to the face because he was to be blamed. That's what the Holy Ghost inspired St. Paul to say. So likewise, my superior and the superior of every Catholic today named Francis in Rome, he is to be blamed, and he is guilty of misusing his authority, and therefore he must be disobeyed. In order to fulfill the requirements within the virtue of obedience, there is excessive obedience and there is defective obedience. Excessive obedience is to obey when we should not obey. Defective obedience is to not obey when we should obey. There are times when we must not be excessive in our obedience, and that is whenever a superior commands us to do that which is evil, that which is against the faith. And therefore I can disobey, and I am obliged to disobey, my superior, Pope Francis, who is my superior, and your superior, and the superior Bishop Sanborn, even though he doesn't know it. He is the superior of every Catholic baptized upon earth. And we must disobey him in order to be faithful. This is easy to understand. Now then what happens? The day that Francis comes back to the fulfillment of his duty, then I obey him. And the city of Picantus argue, well, this is arbitrary. No, it is not. The same reason why St. Picantus disobeyed Francis is the same reason why I disobey him. Because he's teaching error and heresy. The difference is, they are not only disobeying his wicked command, which I as a subject have the right and power to do. When my father, or when the king, commands me to do evil, I have the right and duty to disobey the command. But I do not have the authority to remove him from fatherhood, which is another thing altogether, or to remove him from kingship, which is another thing altogether. I have the right to disobey, but I do not have the right to put him to death. If someone comes and murders my brother, I have the right to defend while they are trying to murder my brother. But I cannot, three weeks later, go and find the murderer and murder him. The only one that has the right to arrest him and to put him on trial is the government. I do not have the right to take vengeance on the death of my brother. I have the right to defend my brother when he is being attacked. I have the right to prevent the murder. I have the right even to kill the one that is trying to kill my brother in self-defense. But I do not have the right to put him on trial. I don't have the right to throw him in prison. I don't have the right to execute him because I am not the authority. So likewise, we have the right to disobey the Pope and the Bishop. We have the right to stand up against their wicked commands. And we have the right to prevent their wicked commands from being fulfilled insofar as we can. Like St. Armour and Bellman said 500 years, 400 years ago. But we don't have the right to declare him not king, to declare him not bishop, to declare him not pope, or not, not, not head of the Rouse Lemonade staff. We don't have the right to do that. We have the right to not drink Rouse Lemonade. We have the right to disobey the command of the king. But we don't have the right to say, you don't have the right, you can't own Lemonade stands. Only the government can do that. It is not so complicated. But in any case, I think Bishop Sanborn was an exa his example of the flight attendants, which is a magnificent example, and of the pilots of the airline, which are magnificent examples that prove St. Picantism wrong. The only unfortunate thing 
is that he used them as arguments to prove it right. But in any case, there is a brief response, or a little bit less brief on the attending of the Great Lake Mass tonight, uh, but, uh, to, the, uh, to the discussion of the sermon of Bishop Sam Warren just a few days ago in response to the Lord Proprio concerning whether or not we can coexist with the wicked leaders in Rome. Really, because you all, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost.